Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to this Institute lecture. Our speaker today is Patricia Crone, who is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor in our School of Historical Studies. At the end of the lecture, there'll be an opportunity for questions, followed by a reception in the Ford Hall Common Room, to which you're all invited. Patricia's research is concerned with the political, religious, and cultural environment in which Islam began and how it transformed and was itself transformed by the regions that the Arabs conquered. At present, she works mainly on the Quran and the cultural, religious traditions of Iraq, Iran, and the formerly Iranian part of Asia, Central Asia. Patricia took her bachelor's degree and doctorate at the, London, at, at the School of Oriental and African Studies of London University, moving in 1974 to the Warburg Institute in London for a period of three years as a senior research fellow. In 1977, she moved to Oxford as a university lecturer in Islamic history and a fellow of Jesus College. In 1990, she became university lecturer in Islamic studies and a fellow of Gonville and Keyes College in the University of Cambridge, who was appointed a university reader in Cambridge in 1994. She joined the faculty of the Institute in 1997. Today, Patricia's title, for you there, is The Acculturated Native Who Rebels, Nativists, Nationalists, and Western Born Jihadists in the Historical Perspective. Patricia. Thank you very much, Peter. Can you, hear, can you all hear me? Well, as you will all remember, in 2002, Omar Saeed Sheikh was arrested for complicity in the murder of Daniel Pearl in Pakistan. Omar Saeed Sheikh was a British-born Muslim, uh, yeah, British-born Muslim who uh, had uh, briefly, a Pakistani origin, who had briefly studied uh, applied mathematics and economics at the London School of Economics before turning to a jihadist career. Three years later, four British Muslims detonated uh, bombs on three underground trains and a bus. Three of them were of Pakistani origin, and one was a Jamaican convert to Islam. Well, here you have one of them looking rather sweet, and all four of them at Luton Station on their way to killing themselves and others. Now, these men, and many others like them in <coughs> Britain, in the rest of Europe, and in, uh, now also in America, exemplify what are the syndrome that I have called the acculturated native who rebels, by which I mean a person hailing from a politically subordinate culture who is living in the society of a politically dominant culture and who finds that his ancestral roots are incompatible with the society in which he's living in which he may even have been born, but against which he now takes political action. There are many examples of this syndrome in history. A couple of years ago, Michael Watson gave a faculty lecture about the most famous of all of them, Moses. <laughs> that is Moses as we think of him, and here is what he would have looked like in his youth. <laughs> the Bible says that he grew up at the Pharaoh's court. It envisages him as an agriculture buddy. And it says that uh, he had an experience which made him realize that he didn't belong with the hegemonic Egyptians, but rather with the Israelites, the oppressed slaves. The London bombers had similarly come to realize that they didn't belong with the British, the hegemonic British, but rather with our mothers, children, brothers and sisters in Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq and Chechnya, as one of them put it. In Michael Walser's lecture, Moses was the paradigmatic nationalist. 
And the nationalists who agitated against the French, British, and other colonial empires, European empires, are perfect examples of the syndrome I'm talking about. Here on the, you have the young Gandhi, British by culture, but uh, not by identity. And here you have him as the Indian version of Moses who led his people out of slavery. But how about this one? Here you have Horopapela, a baptized Maori working for the British missionaries in New Zealand in the 1850s. And here he's acculturated again, as you can see. And here you have him again as Tewa Haumene. I have no idea of how to pronounce these names. Uh, but anyway, here he is as the prophet who united or tried to unite the Maoris for revolt against the British. Uh, he was actually directly inspired by Moses. And he changed both his name and his clothes. But he wasn't a nationalist. He preached a, millenarian, a religious millenarian message of a type usually called nativist. Nativist movements were extremely common in the wake of the European expansion, probably as common, perhaps even more common than nationalist movements. They were just much less effective. Nativists, nationalists, or Western-born jihadists. To me, Moses is paradigmatic of all of them. In all three cases, we are talking about descendants of the victims of great imperial expansions who have migrated to the society of the imperialists, adopted the hegemonic culture and or religion, and walked out again. They aren't always immigrants in the literal sense of having migrated from one you know, country to another, but they have always migrated in cultural terms. They are all what people these days call hybrids. They have all suffered colonization of the mind, as people say these days. That's to say, they have all assimilated, internalized, at least some of the beliefs and values of the conquerors. And then they have come to feel that they don't belong. They all want to go home. And then they face the problem. What home is there for them to go to? Sometimes the imperial power has destroyed their native polity. Sometimes it has just turned it into a puppet state ruled by collaborators. These days, the native polity usually takes the form of a nation, new nation state. But our acculturated rebel doesn't belong there either. It wasn't from Musharraf's Pakistan that uh, Omar Saeed Sheikh became a jihadist. What the new nation states, the successor states, stand for is usually some version of the same hegemonic culture of Western origin. So that, in effect, jihadists born in the Middle East can also be classified as acculturated, westernized rebels, or westernized natives who turn rebel. So here you have one of them Abu Musab Asuri. He is a Syrian. He started as an Islamist opponent of the Syrian regime. And here you have him. He's already a uh, radical in this picture, probably taken in Spain. But at least he's still wearing blue jeans. Here you have him, suitably nativized, teaching global jihad in Afghanistan. Wherever he comes from, the problem of the acculturated native is that he hasn't got a political home to go to. He has to create it, or rather, as he will see it, he has to recreate it, for he will find it in the past. Sunni jihadists find it in the caliphate. 
the nationalists found it in their glorious ancient nations. Countless nativists found it in some cross between an idealized past and the paradisical future. Whatever their ideal, they all have to mobilize their people. They have to rouse them for political action, to persuade them to rise against the pharaoh, uh, to abandon the flesh pots of Egypt for long wanderings in the political desert. So they change their clothes and sometimes their names and they nativize themselves and start preaching about the iniquities of the foreign rulers and or their local collaborators. But you can tell that they are acculturated. Well, I'm not actually sure you really can in the story of Moses. Some people claim you can. But the nationalists obviously drew on the European ideology of nationalism. The uh, nativists, or countless nativists, drew on Christianity, and the jihadists draw on modern Western ideas. Sometimes they, think, they simply think in Western terms, and other times they will study Western ideas for use against the West, just as they use modern Western weapons, or Kalashnikovs and bombs, and modern means of communication, the internet, because the traditional means aren't effective anymore. So what they're doing is that they're all modernizing their ancestral tradition. They're all refurbishing it to make it effective against the superpower of the day. They are revitalizing it, as the anthropologist Wallace said. He said it on nativist movements, and actually most nativist movements have been in the nature of death rattles, so it's not perhaps the best expression, but it's the right idea. Now, I have jumped from Moses to the modern world, but there are examples in between. In the, well, the ancient world yields a rather poor harvest, but in around 450 BC, you have one Ducetius, a Hellenized native of Sicily, who led the Sicils in war against the Greeks, first in alliance with some Greeks against others, but with increasingly nativist overtones. He formed an alliance, or he uh, get, formed a federation of all the cities of the same race, the same ethnos. And he also built his capital city at the sacred precincts of the sickle gods. So religion assisted community formation. Or again, you have Arminius, a uh, tribal noble who rose high in Roman society as commander of a Germanic unit in the Roman army and then turned against the Romans and inflicted the famous defeat on them in year nine. But I have to say that Armenius isn't really an example of the syndrome I'm talking about. And perhaps even Ducetius isn't either. For Ducetius was probably, and Armenius was certainly, a member of the native political elite. Armenius at least had his polity, his political home. He didn't have to create it. He was the equivalent of Musharraf and Mubarak and their likes, not of Omar Said Sheikh. But how about this one? Sumayas or Sulayas? He participated in Bar Kokhba's Jewish revolt against the Romans in 132-5, and he's known only from this papyrus which was found in the Judean desert, and in which he says that he is writing in Greek, or this is written in Greek, because he couldn't find anybody to write in Hebrew. Now, I don't know why he thought he had to write in Hebrew. I mean, Aramaic would have been good enough. <laughs> uh, maybe he didn't know the difference. Some people think that this Sumayas or Sulayas uh, was a convert to Judaism, 
from some subordinate native group in the style of Jermaine Lindsay, the uh, Jamaican convert to Islam who, who uh, joined the London bombers, or Jose Padilla, the Puerto Rican who was born in New York and then converted to Islam and then got uh, con uh, convicted of conspiracy, as they called it. But Sumayas could also have been a Hellenized, born-again Jew, just as some jihadists are born-again Muslims. And in any case, he could only write Greek, just as I'm sure most British jihadists can only write English. The early Islamic world yields a rather better harvest. The acculturate, uh, acculturated natives who rebel here were Iranians who rebelled against the Arabs in the period 755 to 838. Now, there are too many of them. I can't tell you about all of them, but I'll tell you about two. One was a guy called Hashim in Sogdia, which was then part of eastern Iran, which is now in Uzbekistan. He had converted to Islam, I and mean, he was an Iranian, he'd converted to Islam probably by enrolling in a revolutionary movement which was organized in eastern Iran and which I shall say a little bit more about later. After the end of the revolution in 750, he was working as a soldier and army secretary for the provincial governor in Marv. Whoops, that was the wrong one. This one here, Marv. So, uh, like Moses, uh, Gandhi, and the Maori prophet, he had formed part of the hegemonic establishment. But then in 758, the governor he was working for rebelled and was killed, and that was the end of all those who had been associated with him. So, Hashim was sent to jail in Iraq, and when he got back, he wasn't Muslim anymore. He'd had the experience which persuaded him that he didn't form part, that he didn't belong with the hegemonic people, the Arabs. In the story of Moses, the turning point is when Moses sees an Egyptian beat an Israelite. In Gandhi's case, the turning point was when Gandhi was thrown out of a first-class compartment in South Africa as a non-white. In Hashim's case, it was his spell in jail. When he got back, he said that he was an incarnation of the divine spirit and the Mahdi, the Messiah. I mean, it's a Muslim word, uh, word for the Messiah who is to inaugurate the paradisical era. Because as you would expect, there were Muslim elements in his preaching. And he took to wearing a veil to protect his followers from his own divine radiance. And so he got to be known as Al-Muqanna, the veiled one. And here he is as envisaged in English fiction. He was defeated and committed suicide around 780. Another rebel was active on the extreme, on the other uh, frontier of Iran, you know, in the west, in Azerbaijan. He was actually born a Muslim. His father was a non-Arab peddler from Iraq, and his mother was a local village woman, probably a non-Muslim converted by her husband. They gave their sons, all their sons, Muslim names. They were landless villagers, and when uh, Hassan was a child, he was sent to work as a cowherd for one of the Arab magnates who had come to dominate the region. Later, he worked as a groom for another Arab magnate, and then he lost his job. We don't know why. And then he met one Javidan. This Javidan was also an Iranian, but not a Muslim. He was the leader of a native cult organization of a type that you seem to have had in many parts of rural Iran back then. And he converted Hassan 
to his own native religion. Something very similar to what uh, Mukanna uh, reverted to in Sogdia. And Hassan eventually succeeded him as the leader of this organization and changed his name to Parpak, Barbak in modern Persian. Here's the castle he held out in. He rebelled in 816, wanting, he wanted to put an end to Arab Muslim hegemony, I mean, to control of Azerbaijan, just as uh, uh, Mukanna wanted to put an end to it in Sogdia. But he was also defeated after 20 years, uh, captured and gruesomely executed in 838. Now, these two revolts are classic examples of nativist movements in, this, in that the leaders were not members of the native political or religious elite. They were upstarts. Also in that their followers were mostly rural people who owed such organization, military or political organization as they had to religion. Also in that the religion which set them in motion was of a millenarian messianic kind and finally in that those who joined did so because their lives had been turned upside down by the foreign newcomers. In Sogdia the background to the revolution was the utter and the background to the revolt was the utter chaos that followed the revolution of, eight, of 750. In Azerbaijan, the background was, or the trigger was, Arab seizure of native land. That's another classic. It was Greek seizure of sickle land that spurred Dukitius into action in Sicily. It was a, a European seizure of native land that lay behind numerous uh, revolts, uh, nativist revolts against the Europeans, including that of the Maoris. As one Maori said, these men, the missionaries, they were always telling us, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And so, while we were looking to heaven, our land was snatched away from beneath our feet. They had hoped to make it in European society. They'd been told to convert, they had done it, but what for? To lose their land, to continue to be treated as underdogs, to discover that there was no real room for them in Arab society, or <laughs> in <laughs> European society after all. Islam, uh, or the, the uh, uh, rebels against the Europeans often said that Christianity is a religion for white men. And uh, the perception of the Iranian rebels against Islam was precisely that Islam was a religion for Arabs. Now, the Iranian rebels are absorbingly interesting. And if the subject hadn't been so, spe so specialized, I would have talked about nothing else. But they are a purely rural phenomenon. There are two badly documented examples of something similar in Burma, North Africa, a bit later, uh, also rural. And there were probably many that went unrecorded. But there was no corresponding attempt to walk out again by converts in the cities, in Iran or anywhere else in the Islamic world. By contrast, in the wake of the European expansion, you have both nativist revolts, mainly in the countryside, and nationalist movements, mainly in the cities, and now you have the jihadis. So the acculturated rebel who walks out or who rebels the acculturated native who walks out or who rebels is a much more prominent feature in response to the West than he was in response to the Arabs, let alone to the Greeks and the Romans. Now, ideally, I would now do a three-pronged comparison of the acculturated native 
under Greek, Roman, Arab, and European hegemony. But even if I had the knowledge and insight to do that, I wouldn't have the time. So I shall limit myself to a brief comparison of the last two cases. I shall spend most of my time telling you about Islamized natives in Arab society. Then I shall pick out what I regard as the key differences between their experiences and those of westernized natives in European society. So let me just remind you that the Arabs conquered the Middle East outside Arabia roughly between 630 and 730 and initially planted themselves in seven, later a few more, uh, military colonies or garrison cities in diverse parts of the conquered lands. In 661, they moved the capital from Medina, there, to Damascus, one such military settlement. And they thereby reduced their own Arabian homeland to a mere appendix to the empire. Uh, an appendix of enormous ideological significance, but not much practical importance. And from that point onwards, when we talk, we historians, I mean, talk about the Arabs, we mean the Arabs settled outside Arabia, in the Middle East, where they were a very small minority. They kept the conquered lands together by uh, forming a tightly knit military elite with a strong sense of being different from their subjects. They saw themselves as chosen by God to rule the world, and what they wanted from the natives was taxes to finance their way of life and their further expansion. So, how did the natives get drawn into their society? Well, the answer is by conversion, as you would expect, and conversion came about initially in two main ways. And the first is slavery. Like their predecessors in the Near East, the Arabs enslaved captives taken in war. And the numbers we are talking about are huge. Well, of course, we don't have any reliable figures, but I can give you some unreliable ones. <laughs> Two Greek inscriptions relating to the Arab invasion of Cyprus in the 650s claim that the Arabs carried off 120,000 captives in the first invasion and 50,000 in the second, 170,000 in all. The Arab sources barely even mention those two invasions, but they give us to understand that uh, an Arab settlement at the time had between 120,000 and 240,000 inhabitants of which the lower figure is the only one that's credible. Now, if you take these figures at face value, the two expeditions or the two campaigns in Cyprus yielded something approaching or exceeding the total population of an Arab settlement at the time. And there were only seven of them then. Of course, we can't take those figures at face value. But we do know that there were many more, much bigger campaigns, in the, uh, and many more than seven, uh, in the course of the conquest, yielding many more captives. So the Arabs must quickly have become outnumbered, been outnumbered, not only by the non-Arabs non -Arabs in general in the Near East or Middle East, but also by their slaves in their very own settlements. Of course, that could have gone badly wrong. At one point, it did look a little bit hairy. But here comes the important point. Slavery was mostly domestic. Practically all Arabs had slaves. I mean, not just the highest. From highest to the lowest, the way people these days have 
cars and washing machines and refrigerators. So the captives were distributed in mostly quite ordinary Muslim homes where they would live cheek by jowl with their new masters, bond with them, produce children by them willy-nilly, uh, adopt their religion, and eventually be set free. And as freedmen, they were, in principle, full members of Muslim society. Of course, in practice, they were treated with contempt. No Arab worth his salt would give his daughter to one, and they were deemed quite unsuitable for positions of authority, and so on. But because the Arabs were so few, they had to use non-Arabs as administrators of all kinds and uh, soldiers. And they preferred to use Muslims where they could. So it doesn't take long before you begin to find the freedmen all over, everywhere, even in positions of authority. In fact, already in, in the 720s, you hear of the son of a freedman who was offended when he got a less prestigious governorship than the one he set his eyes on because he wasn't an Arab. Now, he had a big sense of entitlement. That's why we hear of him. But the interesting point is that he clearly thought of the empire, the caliph or polity, as his own. And in that respect, he was typical. When non-Arab converts were badly treated, the, they usually concluded that something was wrong with the Arabs, and especially with the ruling dynasty. But not with Islam, and not with the polity, the uh, empire that uh, Islam had created either. In short, slavery, domestic slavery functioned as a giant assimilation machine. The other way people converted was by flight to the cities. The free converts you hear about in the first century of after the conquest were not usually aristocrats. They were peasants, and it is in fact peasants, but most of the uh, freedmen, or the slaves, the captives, must also mostly have been peasants. Anyway, the free converts uh, left their land and went, went off to be Muslims in the garrison cities, in the Muslim settlements, where they wouldn't be taxed and where uh, they would try to get themselves registered on the military roll, which would entitle them to pay and rations. Like the Maoris, they thought that, and others, they thought that conver by converting to the religion of the uh, conquerors, they would get access to their privileged ranks. And unlike the Maoris, they were sort of right. And that is what is so amazing about it. You can't normally become the member of an imperial elite by saying, woohoo, I'm one of yours. But in effect, you could uh, uh, in, in uh, Muslim society because the Muslim polity was a community of believers. Anyone could convert to Islam, even a peasant, even a slave. As it happened, the community of believers was also a conquest society, conferring imperial privilege. So you have this conquest society in which the barriers to membership are set absurdly low. You didn't need a long and expensive education. You didn't need 25 years of army service or anything like that in order to become a member of the conquest elite. All you needed to do was to recite the confession of faith in front of a Muslim willing to act as your patron. It was a totally absurd way of doing things. It's crazy. And the Arab authorities knew it. They tried to stem the tide. They, uh, they, some, some, sometimes they would uh, test the converts, see if they actually knew anything about Islam. Uh, they would also uh, refuse to register them on the military roll. And sometimes they would deport them outright as illegal immigrants. 
And conservative Arabs would argue that God gave the truth to us, not to all those people who fought against us and now want to join us. They wanted the community of believers to be coterminous with their own ethnic group, or at least to be anchored in it. But however much they might push away converts with one hand, they kept accepting them in the form of freedmen in, with the other. So the long and the short of it is that the Arabs dug their own grave. The privileged conquest elite disappeared in no time at all. The important point here is that the Arabs explained their own success, their own supremacy with reference to Islam. God, the one and only power in the universe, was on their side. In other words, Islam played the same role in the Arab expansion as did modern science, technology, and related secular ideas in the European expansion. It explained why they were invincible. So just as nobody could resist the pull of the secular ideas spread by the powerful Europeans, so everybody felt the pull of Islam spread by the powerful Arabs. The mistake of the Maoris and their likes was that they deduced from the missionaries' teachings that it was Christianity which was the key to European society and its power. But the European polities were not communities of believers, they were nations. It was easy enough to convert to Christianity as well, but it was a dead end. But it wasn't usually a dead end for the converts to Islam in the cities, as opposed to the countryside. In the cities, Islam was an avenue of upward social mobility. The Arabs unwittingly turned the social map of the Near East upside down. I mean, they drew in these huge masses of low-status people, and by simply accepting them as Muslims, they inadvertently made them the pool from which the new elite was drawn. So already by the 730s, 740s, a mere century after the conquest, Muslim society had drastically changed. The entire civilian sphere, including religious scholarship, was dominated by non-Arabs, and the Arabs were only just hanging on to their supremacy in the military and political spheres. And, you know, many of the so-called Arabs were actually of mixed parentage, or they were simply Muslims who spoke Arabic, and who sometimes tried to pass for Arabs, sometimes not. Go to al Ahwaz, for example. Some caliphal troops were stationed there, in case you haven't noticed it. Some caliphal troops were stationed there in the, from Syria, uh, stationed there in the uh, 740s, and among them you have this man called Hania, a client, and I should say a non-Arab Muslim, married to an Iranian woman. He has a daughter who married a slave called Farah al Qasar, so presumably a fuller, to judge by his name. And the owner of this slave was also a non-Arab Muslim from somewhere in Iraq. The son, on the other hand, Hassan, uh, went on to become better known uh, as Abu Nuwas, uh, the greatest Arabic poet of his time, or some would say of all times. That's how you should envisage much of so-called Arab society on the ground. Now you will say, that must have been the end of the empire. Once the thin stratum of uh, conquerors had ceased to be sharply marked off from the conquered peoples, what was there to hold all these diverse lands together? But the dilution of the conquest elite had taken place by the natives coming into their society in the name of the conqueror's own belief system. 
with the result that the native converts had become the main bearers of that belief system. They had taken over Islam, if you like. And what happened next was not that the empire disintegrated, but rather that the converts, the non-Arabs, took over that too. And they did that in the revolution uh, which was organized in eastern Iran, which I mentioned earlier, headquarters in Marv. Uh, it, that revolution installed a new dynasty known as the Abbasids in 750 in Iraq. And what is so striking about that revolution is that it was not restorationist, not secessionist, not proto-nationalist, nothing of the kind. It wasn't even conducted mainly by, uh, or it wasn't even conducted by Iranians alone, but rather by hybrids of both Iranian and uh, Arab ancestry. And the Arabs weren't made to withdraw to Arabia either. They merely lost such monopoly as they retained on political and military affairs. In short, it was a little bit as if a coalition of westernized Indians and Indianized Englishmen had taken over the British Empire and reduced the British to a very honorable, but nonetheless distinctly limited role in running it. Now, the revolution was by no means the end of the tense relationship between Arabs and non-Arabs uh, in Islam. The Arabs were still highly prestigious, and their status in Islam continued to be controversial and a problem, both politically and socially and well, politically, socially and culturally. It's in the aftermath of the revolution that you have the nativist revolts in rural Iran that I mentioned, and it's also after the revolution that uh, the non-Arabs, -Muslim, non Muslims, especially Iranians, began a literary onslaught on the Arabs. I mean, they were writing in the cities, uh, often in the capital, writing in Arabic against the Arabs. The empire began to write back, you could say. But the people who voiced these stridently anti-Arab sentiments, why did they, they didn't reject, they didn't walk out of either Islam, the religion, or of the empire, the, caliphal polity that Islam had created. What they wanted was, well, in modern terminology, cultural decolonization. The uh, new empire broke up about a century later in the 850s for different reasons. Islam continued to spread, it continued to generate problems, but with the exception of the two North African cases that I mentioned, you don't have anti-Islamic revolts by former Muslims again. So much for the Arabs. Now the Europeans. Now, the most obvious difference is that the Europeans didn't spread in the name of Christianity. But I don't think that Christianity would have functioned the way Islam did, even if they had. For it wasn't simply by converting to Islam that the natives of the Middle East succeeded in taking over the empire. It was by diluting the ranks of the conquerors, by rapidly becoming the influential majority in the latter's own society. And that wasn't on the cards in the European case because the Europeans had their homelands overseas, far away and their homelands were never reduced to mere appendices to the empires. It was the other way around. It was the empires that were appendices to France, Britain, whatever. It would have been a different story if, for example, the British had moved their capital to Cairo or Delhi. But they didn't need to do that because they weren't tribesmen from some impoverished periphery in search of power, taxes, and uh, slaves, but rather wealthy capitalists in search of markets and raw materials. The British, to stay with them, of course, also needed administrators, 
and soldiers and recruited natives for that purpose. But they didn't have to use natives or nativized Brits for the top positions. They could keep sending new men from Britain and they never used natives in the metropole itself. So westernized na uh, natives didn't automatically come to think of the empire as their own. And in some sense you could say the British never thought of it as, as, their, as their, thought of it as their own either. Because they were never quite sure that they really wanted an empire because they could get what they wanted, or they could often get what they wanted, without taking formal political control. And they never thought that, that the, their empires were permanent, or rather, they didn't think that they would stay in those parts of the empire which had political organization and high cultures of their own, like India, for example. So they never made themselves at home in the land the way the Arabs did, and they didn't see themselves as doomed to coexistence with these natives. I mean, sooner or later, they would become independent. And of course, there was no equivalent of domestic slavery as an assimilation machine. What the Europeans disseminated was secular Western culture, modernity. And like Islam, modernity continued to spread long after the empires had broken up. But modernity didn't, and still doesn't, create a fellowship. The Europeans did bring two fellowships with them, like the Arabs did. That of the church and that of the ethnic group, the nation. But it was the nation, not the religious uh, community, which formed part of modernity, the winning packet. And the trouble with the nation from an imperial point of view is that you can't have everybody in it. Nationalism makes a virtue of the ethnic and racial origins that divide us. It did what conservative Arabs would have liked to do, make the uh, ethnic group coterminous with imperial privilege, or roughly coterminous with. Westernization did not confer membership of the conqueror's community in either principle or practice, not even for the educated elite in the cities. What westernization did create in the cities was a large number of people who had been defined out of their native communities by their Western education, without being formally or informally accepted as members of the community to which their education assigned them. In short, if the Muslims made the barrier to membership absurdly low, the Europeans made it absurdly high. The only way to get respect on nationalist premises was to establish a nation state of your own. In other words, where Islamization drew you into the imperial polity, Westernization set you against it. So in the empire, empires of the Europeans, even the acculturated natives in the cities followed the example of Moses and walked out. It was only after the end of the European empires that the natives began to dilute the ranks of the former conquerors in their own homelands and in America. And as we can see now, the result will probably be, probably be the formation of a new cosmopolitan global high culture over and above our local identities. It is in any case now, well after the empire, that we Westerners are sharing the Arabs' experience. Non-Westerners are becoming the main bearers of modernity, the influential majority of what we used to think of as Western culture, just as 
non-Arabs became the main bearers, the influential majority in Islam, the religion that the Arabs thought of as their religion. And now, as then, the transfer generates political and cultural tensions. How is political power going to be reorganized to reflect this shift? What is the position of the initial bearers of modernity, the Westerners, going to be in the new synthesis, the new global high culture under formation? Whose literary heritage, whose past, and whose beliefs and values are going to be normative in it? Well, you could say that the jihadis are putting in very visible bids. I doubt very much that they will be that a vanguard of a, a revolution like that in 750, but are they just a rearguard like that of al muqanna and Barbak? I am not sure of that either, but time will tell. Thank you. Patricia's willing to answer some questions. Please. Oleg. No. I Frontiers certainly matter, but I don't think it's the frontier spirit that matters. You do have uh, similar movements uh, in uh, Jibel and in Ray. In fact, you have it in the whole of Western Iran. But uh, th the reason why I concentrated on those two is that we are, know far more about them uh, uh, th than the two on the frontiers. And the reason that we know more about the two of the frontiers is that they were much more successful. And the reason why they were much more successful is precisely that they were on the frontier. They only had Muslims on one side, and they could enroll uh, non-Muslim powers to assist them. Well, that's the sort of question I don't dare to, to, to answer because, uh, as a medievalist, I don't feel competent. But, uh, I mean, it's, it seems very like, I can only give the very tame answer, uh, that, that it seems extremely likely. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure there are other people here who, who uh, will feel uh, competent to explain that. I only deal with what's happened. Well, and that's true, I did say, no, I only deal with what's happened. Not with what will happen. <laughs> More questions? Please. So you started with the jihadists in London. Yeah. I still don't understand why you blow up a train station. Why blow up a train station? They didn't blow up a train station, they blew up the, uh, they planned it. No, no, the underground. Or you get you. I mean, you have a lot of captive people there who can uh, who who will be killed. But well, you well. First of all, I have to say that I think all Western jihad, Western-born jihadists, are extremely pathetic figure, uh, figures who have very little idea of what they're doing. But they are, they get the gen, they get the general sense that by that the you know, global jihad means that we all rise up and we all disrupt 
the workings of, of Western society, and sooner or later this will enab enable the Muslims to take over. So any kind of disruption, any kind of killing, and, and any kind of fear that you, th that you uh, uh, manage to create will help you. That's the idea. I mean, they did have a, I mean, the London, even the London bombers, I mean, they certainly had an effect. I mean, they, 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 terrorism does, does have an effect. It hasn't, it hasn't caused the British society to collapse or American society to collapse, but it certainly changed them. Michael? There's Michael. Oh, No, I'm not assuming that. I mean, there actually was further migration, and we know, uh, I mean, it's reflected in the creation of uh, uh, two further uh, uh, military settlements in northern Syria and Mesopotamia, and also we hear about the newcomers in Basra, who then uh, contribute to the uh, colonization of uh, uh, Khorasan. But that's all over by the 680s, and although you know they are significant, I mean I don't think they're significant enough. The the, the increase is significant enough to 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 change the analysis, and it's very striking that thereafter you hear about nothing, nothing, from Arabia. It dried up. Yeah. Further questions? Please. I hinder the, the change, a different uh, proximity of <coughs> communication, different quality of communication between the peoples. And the, the type that you're talking about is a very um, kind of compact narrative structure of um, an individual who's acculturated, there's a transformative experience, and then they become politically active. And so I'm wondering how this gets translated within the context of modern media and the kind of rapid circulation. But when I talked about the difference between uh, city and countryside uh, in uh, the Islamic world, I didn't actually mean, I wasn't actually referring to media or to the uh, uh, communication. I was talking about the fact that if you converted in the countryside, you just stayed in more or less the same world and were, uh, were the victim of whatever uh, you know, land grabs or uh, revolutionary uh, changes were imposed from above, whereas if you went to the cities, you had uh, opportunities to make it in a new society that, hadn't, uh, you, had never, that had, you had had possibilities in that you would never have had in the previous society. Uh, communications, I'm, I'm not sure it, it, uh, it matters, uh, they matter greatly in, in, in my case. I mean, they do today, but... Uh, I don't know whether, whether, were you asking about something slightly like different? I, I think that in setting up this type uh -huh. that undergoes over the course of two millennia, that one needs to take into account um, different forms of representation, uh -huh. the speed with which these ideas are being transmitted. And I think while there, you know, there are lots of parallels to jihadists in London, uh, simply by the nature of Uh huh. Well, I don't quite. No, don't quite know. I don't know how, for example, somebody. Uh, yeah, you, in the countryside, you would get your your information, the view of the Arabs from the local Arabs, and uh, you. I mean, you wouldn't get it from outside unless you had been. I mean, in the case of Babak, uh, in the case of Mukanna, he actually knew Arabs from uh, from his period in in the city of Marb. But uh, in most of the cases, also the case in, in Jibal, uh, they, they know only, I mean, to them, Arabs and Islam is what they see on the ground locally, which is, course, makes it very different from, from today. I mean, they don't know anything about the equivalence of Chechnya, of Afghanistan, Iraq, and uh, Palestine. 
So, Karen? Yes. And so, um, why didn't that work out? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I know the answer, which is that they, they were still, they, there was still no rise in the echelons of power for the natives, right? I mean, and that, that actually, the, despite the rhetoric, there was no power. For example, that's certainly part of it. But again, you know, we are now moving into into uh, periods I know very little about. But I will also say that I think it is particularly difficult. I mean, the, the further you get in history, the more difficult it gets to be to go and conquer people and simply make them your own. And that it's particularly difficult in the, in the case of uh, uh, monotheists uh, like the Jews and the Muslims. So the fact that uh, Algeria was Muslim must also have played a role. Say that the I mean, we know, I mean, the, 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 the British did have settler colonies. Uh, Australia, I mean, the Maoris, I mean, they, they, they uh, people without literary traditions and, and political tradition of their own uh, can't mobilize the kind of resistance. They haven't got the kind of uh, heritage to draw, the ideas to draw on, the kind of, uh, they haven't got the kind of community to draw on uh, as, as people did as Muslims. So I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I don't know what would have happened if the French had had a completely different attitude to to uh, to uh, uh, Muslims uh, in Algeria. I doubt very. I mean, it might have been better, but I doubt very much whether they would have made it. I just don't think you can do it with, with Muslims. Sure. Uh, India had some and fewer now than the previous situation. And uh, the Russian Empire and Chechnya. Now, I, this I got that far from the paper. And then I started wondering uh, about South America and uh, the whole Spanish uh, uh, colonization. I think it produced a very different result in South America from, let's say, the French, British, and Portuguese. Okay, uh, I mean, the reason why my, I concentrate on these two is not that they both have Muslims in it, of course, that helps, it makes it more relevant, uh, but uh, it's that they both are uh, uh, the outcome of empires, and you have very different outcomes. And I completely agree with you that uh, in an ideal world, I should compare all empires, I mean, uh, what happens, uh, <laughs> but uh, as I said, I mean, even, even doing it with, with, with antiquity uh, is pretty difficult. Uh, I don't want to go into uh, the, the South American experience, but it's certainly something I, 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 it's on my, on my list of things to do. But, the, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it will yield another variant. I don't see that it's going to invalidate the, the, the comparison that I made. You know. I think at this point we should thank Patricia again for her lecture and continue discussion in full <laughs> And that's my PowerPoint debut. Oh, great. <laughs>